Thank you and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests all. Uh, my name is Ken McIntosh. I'm the presiding officer here at the Scottish Parliament and it's my uh, privilege, my delight to welcome you all here to uh, our debating chamber uh, and to this, the official opening of the fourth Edinburgh International Cultural Summit. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces and some old friends, uh, but I also appreciate that for many of you, this uh, Maybe your first time in the Scottish Parliament and possibly even your first time in Scotland. So, on behalf of all my Scottish parliamentary colleagues, may I offer you a traditional Scottish Gaelic welcome, Curd Meal Falcher, 100,000 welcomes. And as I'm sure you're aware, the summit is a partnership between the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish and UK governments, the British Council and the Edinburgh International Festival. And I'm delighted to say that we will be hearing from each of our partners shortly. But before doing so, I think it is worth reflecting on why we are here. I believe very strongly in the role that culture and the arts play in promoting international dialogue and understanding. And this summit provides a unique forum for debate and discussion about international cultural policy. As we gather in a city currently hosting the world's largest festival of the arts and culture, and in a building designed, in the words of its architect, to be a space for shared conversation, not sterile confrontation, I can think of no better venue to do so. The inaugural Cultural Summit in 2012 brought together a range of internationally renowned speakers and artists from 33 countries around the world to discuss how arts and culture are best sustained promoted and protected, as well as to provide new opportunities for cultural exchange. And now in 2018, we host the fourth and the largest of our summits with 42 official delegations representing all corners of the globe. It has been a delight to see the Culture Summit go from strength to strength. The overarching theme of this year's summit is culture, connecting people and places, and it weaves together three programme strands which we will explore in detail over the coming days. These strands will reflect on the fractured world in which we live and demonstrate how culture can make connections across perceived divisions in society. And I hope you'll agree that at a time when uh, of great geopolitical and societal upheaval, exploring this diversity is of paramount importance. In both plenary sessions in this chamber and in the policy discussions that will take place throughout the parliamentary campus, we will discuss the following three interlinked policy strands. And they are culture in a connected world. How can culture build bridges of understanding across peoples, generations and societies in a fragmented world? Culture and investment the need to strike a balance between investment in physical infrastructure, building new theatres and museums, and alternative mode models of investment uh, to support our creative talent to reach new and wider audiences. And finally, culture and well-being, exploring how participation in cultural activity can positively affect our health. So we have plenty to do and to get on with over the next couple of days, and I do hope you find the summit both interesting and enjoyable but I would also strongly encourage you to take every opportunity uh, to make the most of your time here in the Parliament and in Edinburgh to network and to exchange ideas with each other. I hope that being here in this vibrant capital of Scotland at festival time and in this wonderful Parliament building provides that extra spark of creativity. So once again, on behalf of all my, for, uh, my fellow colleagues and members of the Scottish Parliament, welcome to Holyrood and I'm delighted you're here. I wish you well in your deliberations. Thank you. Now, I would like to uh, formally uh, begin proceedings and to invite as a first speaker Sir Kieran Devan, Chief Executive of the British Council, to welcome guests here to the Edinburgh International Cultural Summit. Sir Kieran. Thank you, President, Officer, uh, First Minister, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Um, it's a 
a huge privilege for, for me to be here again. Um, and as Ken mentioned, uh, at a time when culture has such a huge contribution uh, to make to fixing this fractured world uh, to which he referred, um, those of us who um, know the British Council, and I know many of you do, um, might well know we were um, established in 1940, which uh, um, when I sometimes have to remind some of my colleagues there was something even bigger than Brexit going on. Um, and in that, that very first document, it talks about um, the role of fostering the interchange of knowledge, ideas, and discoveries, and says that, that that is the role of the prudent state, and that the reason to do it is to create a basis of friendship, knowledge, and understanding between people. So friendship you know, between our communities, within our countries, um, knowledge of each other, knowledge of the world's heritage, knowledge of our histories and where we came from so we know where we might be going, and understanding of, of our own complexities, but the complexities of some of the conflicts, but also some of the solutions which lie ahead of us. Um, I first really thought about this um, from uh, my homeland. Um, I'm Irish, and um, we too suffered from uh, community conflict. And it, while the police and the military reduced the level of violence, it, they were not the people who brought peace. The people who brought peace were people reaching across the community and creating the political space, which then allowed ultimately the Good Friday Agreement to be signed 20 years ago this year. And it was musicians who were the first people to reach across the boundaries, punk musicians as it happened, uh, and then the women's movement. And it was that knowledge, that understanding, um, between communities which created the process from which uh, peace began. And really what they were doing was building trust. Um, economists don't agree on very much, but one of the things they do agree on is that prosperous societies with high levels of cohesion, with stability, with good levels of security, have high levels of trust. So fostering that trust, I think, is a critical role of those of us who work in the sphere of culture. Because what we're doing is we are sharing that knowledge, those ideas, and that understanding. And out of that comes trust, out of that comes prosperity, out of that comes security. So when we talk about culture, we're not just talking about our history and where we came from and what we're proud of. We're talking about um, culture being a vehicle for economic development and indeed for development economics. And I think it is one of the great levers which as yet is underexploited. So on my behalf of that of my colleagues and our partners uh, in the summit, thank you for being here. Delighted to uh, be with you and look forward to our conversations over the next day or two. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Kieran. I would now like to invite my parliamentary colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External Affairs, Fiona Hislop, MSP, to welcome guests on behalf of the Scottish Government. I am very grateful to you, uh, Presiding Officer, and our parliamentary colleagues for their role in organising this event. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Scottish Government's other partners and funding partners. Uh, Sir so Jonathan Mills uh, deserves a special praise for helping pull together such an innovative programme as do the Summit Foundation team uh, led by Sir Angus Grossert who has helped to lever in support from so many partners. Thank you. On behalf of the Scottish Government, uh, which has responsibility for culture policy in Scotland, uh, welcome to Scotland. As the Government Minister involved in establishing this Global Summit back in 2012, I'm delighted to see how it has grown and developed. On the day that this great building housing the Scottish Parliament was officially opened in 2004, Liz Lockhead read a poem written by the late Edwin Morgan, our first national macker. A macker is an old Scots word for poet. The poem begins with these words of wisdom, which I think are a fitting welcome to the 2018 uh, Edinburgh International Culture Summit. Open the doors, light of the day shine in, light of the mind shine out. We have a building which is more than a building. We give you this great building. Don't let your work and hope be other than great when you enter and begin. So now begin, open the doors and begin. So welcome also to Edinburgh. 
As our capital city, Edinburgh has forever shaped our thinking about who we are as a nation. Edinburgh is steeped in a history that is defined by the coming together of people, cultures and ideas from around the world. It is as open to the world now as it ever was, and during the festival, it feels as though the Edinburgh, that Edinburgh belongs to the entire world. So I hope you all have the chance to sample some of what Scotland and Edinburgh has to offer during your stay. And the Edinburgh's festivals shape and promote Scotland's identity as a confident, creative and welcoming nation. Edinburgh is hosting the largest celebration of the arts anywhere on the planet, with the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, the largest arts festival in the world. At the festival's peak, we have 25,000 artists, entertainers, thinkers and writers populating the city with over a thousand shows per day. Now that audience attendance is the equivalent of hosting a FIFA World Cup every year. Uh, the 2018 Edinburgh International Programme uh, burst into life with a very moving and spectacular programme, Five Telegrams, which commemorated World War I and celebrated Scotland's Year of Young People through a remarkable fusion of creativity and innovation. A powerful example of how culture and arts can reflect the past, challenge the present and shape the future. And in addition to Edinburgh's festivals, all year round, there are hundreds of festivals and celebrations in Scotland. Just this month, uh, Glasgow, jointly with Berlin uh, and funded by the Scottish Government, hosted the highly successful 2018 European Championships. Now, this was first ever. It was a bold, innovative event. It brought together seven sporting championships on this, at the same time, and it was watched by over a billion viewers on television. And alongside that world-class sporting offer, uh, just like the 2014 Commonwealth Games hosted in Glasgow, we delivered an exceptional cultural programme, Festival 2018, alongside it. So these events are, are wonderful in their own right, however. Uh, festivals also speak deeply to Scotland's sense of itself. We're a nation that cherishes culture for its empowering and transformative power, as underlined in our draft culture strategy. And also, if you read the quotations on the Canongate wall, which are at the side and part of this building, you'll see that poetry is literally built in to the building of the Scottish Parliament. So we're proud of the vibrancy, the diversity and the excellence of our traditions and our contemporary cultures. And of course, it feels hugely important now when the UK, despite Scotland's vote to, to remain, is set to leave the European Union. And so the festivals, yes, are a brilliant excuse for a party, but they also demonstrate, celebrate and strengthen a sense of internationalism that we hold very dear. And that internationalism is why we established this Edinburgh International Culture Summit in 2012. And at a time when international dialogue and hearing the voices and the views of everyone is increasingly important, the theme of connecting peoples and places for this summit is very apt. So this summit provides unique opportunities to forge new relations, rekindle old ones, for us to learn from each other and for discussions to take place on the role and the value of the arts. And I'm particularly delighted that this summit has a strong focus on young people and I look forward to the telling contribution the youth delegates will make. They will be vocal, they will be passionate and I expect them to challenge us all. Uh, and so I believe there is no better place or time to host the Culture Summit. This summit provides an unrivaled platform to debate, consider and take actions uh, and are of interest for all of us. We want to generate ideas, gain insights, discuss and most importantly listen and make connections. So con Scotland uh, continues to be a welcome, open society where we embrace different voices and opinions so thank you for so much for joining us.
Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And turning to our other governmental partner, can I welcome uh, guest, to welcome guests on behalf of the Cab Government of the United Kingdom, we have the Right Honourable Jeremy Wright, QC MP, Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport in the UK. Thank, you, Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it's great to be able to join in the welcome to you all for this uh, fourth International Edinburgh Culture Summit. And there is, of course, no better backdrop to this event than this wonderful city during the height of the festival season. And as you will already appreciate and come to appreciate, these iconic festivals are a living, breathing example of the incredible power of culture in transforming our lives and our cities. Visitors across the world have been flocking to see some of our biggest names side by side with smaller productions, and of course, giving our economy a boost as they do so. The Edinburgh International Festival and The Fringe encapsulate the creativity and ingenuity that can be found all across the United Kingdom. And as we leave the European Union, we will use that creativity to show the world that we remain an open, welcoming, and outward-looking nation. And this summit provides a unique platform for ministers and cultural leaders from across the globe to discuss the big issues that impact us all. One of the themes of this summit particularly struck me, and that was culture in a networked world. As our Culture is Digital report identified. Technology offers unprecedented opportunities for culture in the UK and beyond. Every day, we see the seismic power of technology and its ability to engage new audiences, drive new business models, and increase access to world-class archives and collections. Some of our oldest and most prestigious sites are using technology to meet demand for new digital experiences and to reach those less engaged with culture. Cultural organizations also have a powerful role to play in how we interpret information in the digital age. In a world of social media echo chambers, cultural organizations are vital in challenging our views and introducing us to new perspectives. And I know that many of you are working on your own programs to combat your great, uh, to combine rather your great cultural institutions with the most cutting edge, impressive technology. This will be the new cultural frontier over the coming years. And we can only really make the most of it if we are open-minded and we work together, regardless of boundaries. That's why events like this are so important. So thank you to Sir Jonathan Mills and to your team for your continued passion and dedication and for your hard work in organizing this event. Thank you to all the partners involved in making it happen, the Scottish Government, the British Council, Edinburgh International Festival, and the Scottish Parliament. And speaking of the Scottish Parliament, thank you to Presiding Officer for allowing us to host the summit in this spectacular chamber. So let us all make the most of this opportunity because culture shows humanity at our best. So it's my privilege to help open this important summit, the ideas and conversations that we will share over the coming days will show the world how the enduring power of culture can strengthen the bonds between our nations. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. And we will now hear from uh, Programme Director of the 2018 Edinburgh International Cultural Summit, Sir Jonathan Mills, on the content of the summit programme. Thank you. Presiding Officer, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I add my warm welcome to those of the Presiding Officer, of the Chief Executive of the British Council, of the Secretary of State and the Cabinet Secretary. I'm especially delighted in this year of young people in Scotland to greet so many youth delegates to the 2018 Edinburgh International Culture Summit. The title of this year's summit, Culture Connecting Peoples and Places, affirms that culture is a prism through which to perceive the equilibrium of any society and to suggest that the poems and plays, songs and ceremonies 
photographs and paintings which we choose to share with each other are fundamental to the vibrancy and cohesiveness of the places in the world we seek to create. The Edinburgh International Culture Summit is hosted by a city in which for 71 years cultural relationships of the most varied and intense kind have been initiated and nurtured. As much as it is a Scottish initiative, it offers a genuinely international perspective and I urge you to embrace this as your summit in your festival, not just our festival. Your presence here is an encouragement, as the Minister has said, to the 25,000 artists from all over the world, from 70 to 80 nations, who gather in this city every year. Equally, as a forum in which practitioners and politicians, this year representing 45 countries, can come together, the summit provides you all with a platform to discuss and promote substantial global issues of mutual interest, to network with ministerial delegations, and to engage with highly ambitious alliances of artists and cultural professionals. As you will see and hear from actors Pu Kun Shin and Charlene Boyd in their dramatic renderings of Shakespeare and Li Bai in a moment, from choreographer Akram Khan on the forecourt of the Palace of Holyrood House later this evening, and from musicians Feras Charistan, Basil Rajub, and Julian Herman, and actress Bea Webster during the course of the next few days, um, as well as um, attendances at all of the festivals that are going on in this city at the moment, and to top it all off, a visit to Dundee, a sneak preview of the VNA about to be opened in a couple of weeks. We place art and its practitioners at the center of the conversation that we are about to have. This event is supported by an independent charity chaired by Sir Angus Grosset. On behalf of the founding partners, I'd like to thank Sir Angus and the trustees of the Summit Foundation, along with all our corporate philanthropic and individual supporters for their contributions. If as an artist I've learned anything from the inspiring discussions that have emerged from this summit since 2012, it is a greatly enhanced appreciation of the truly complex challenges that each and every minister of culture faces in advocating for culture within the processes of governments and bureaucracies. We live in a world in, that faces huge challenges, exploding population growth, diminishing natural resources, banishing indigenous cultures, increasing tribalism and bitter localized feuds, human dislocation of unprecedented dimensions, of large scale suffering from preventable and treatable disease. In searching for some words that grasp the depths of some of our dilemmas, I'd like to share what a young, optimistic political leader had to say about a world that remains addicted to defining itself by a rather narrow set of measurements. Speaking at the University of Kansas in March 1968, a few months before his tragic assassination, Robert Kennedy said this, too much and for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. 
I hope that the ideals so eloquently expressed by Robert Francis Kennedy at a, at a time of equal and substantial social change to our own, half a century ago, might inspire and guide your deliberations in this city and this parliament during our short time together. Please enjoy this summit and most especially this city and its festival. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And in case you're wondering, we're going to hear from the last of our uh, partners at the closing ceremony, Fergus Linehan from the Edinburgh International Festival. However, we're now going to hear, if I can, uh, the first of our presentations, uh, which will lead into the plenaries, the uh, private policy discussions and the uh, informal dialogue, which we hope you will all have with each other and which will mark a successful summit. And I'm delighted to say that the first uh, speaker is going to be Scotland's First Minister, the Right Honourable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP. And I'd like to invite the First Minister up to the podium to address the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government, let me very warmly welcome all of you to Scotland, to our capital city, uh, right now the cultural capital of the world, Edinburgh, and of course in particular to our beautiful Scottish Parliament, all of you particularly those visiting for the very first time, are very welcome indeed. It is a real pleasure for me and my colleagues in the Scottish Government to welcome you here uh, as the hosts of this Culture Summit. It's also appropriate that I echo the thanks that have been articulated by previous speakers to the Scottish Government's partners, uh, those who are delivering this summit alongside us, the British Council, the Edinburgh International Festival and the UK Government. Uh, let me also thank Sir Angus Grossart and the Summit Foundation and in particular Sir Jonathan Mills, the Programme Director, for putting together such an exciting uh, and vibrant programme for this summit. The Edinburgh International Culture Summit is, without a shadow of a doubt, in my unbiased opinion, the world's leading forum for the discussion of arts and culture policy. I'm absolutely delighted that this year, more than 150 artists, policymakers, producers and thinkers from over 40 countries across the world are taking part. Your presence here speaks to our shared belief that culture is of central importance to any society. It also demonstrates our shared commitment to improve the way we support, develop and promote our culture sectors. The Summit Programme focuses on how we can do that. It does that by looking at three central themes. The importance of government investment in culture, the relationship between culture and well-being and the role of culture in an increasingly networked world. All of these themes have particular relevance to Scotland. The link between culture and well-being, I hope, seems very obvious in Edinburgh all year round, but particularly in the month of August. Like thousands of others, I have the experience of enjoying the incredible atmosphere created by the Edinburgh festivals during this uh, period of August. And it is obvious everywhere in Edinburgh at this time that the ability of culture to inspire, excite and bring joy is very apparent. Uh, it's also its ability to make us think. I had the pleasure a couple of days ago of interviewing one of our greatest writers, Ali Smith, at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. And she reminded us then of the words of another of our great writers, Muriel Spark, whose centenary we are celebrating this year, who said that culture should make us feel, but culture should also make us think. And that is evidence, uh, evident everywhere in Edinburgh right now. But of course, culture affects well-being in many different ways and in many different contexts. As part of this summit programme, a number of contributors will speak about the different ways in which cultural activity can improve our health and well-being. For example, we'll hear about the way dance has been used to help people deal with the trauma of the Rwandan genocide. And we'll hear about the use of music to treat chronic illness in the Netherlands. 
Now, obviously, not every specific example is directly transferable to all other countries. But the basic principle that culture has an impact on well-being is an important one. And in fact, it is a principle that is now directly and very firmly recognised by the Scottish Government in our policy making. Earlier this summer, we published a refreshed version of our national performance framework. That's a document that sets out the Scottish Government's overall purpose. And it includes different indicators which show whether or not we're achieving our aims. In the new version of that framework, we have for the first time included the concept of national well-being. And we've identified the vibrancy of our cultural life as one of the key indicators of our national well-being. That means, for the first time ever, our efforts to improve well-being will be measured and we will pay as much attention to those efforts as we do to our efforts to grow our economy. It also means that the importance of culture is reflected in the very purpose of the Scottish Government and in how we judge our success as a country. Uh, and I would suggest that it starts to live up to the sentiments uh, of Robert Kennedy, uh, so recently articulated by Jonathan Mills. And I'm particularly proud that on the day we launched uh, our new national framework, uh, I quoted that very passage uh, of Robert Kennedy that we've just heard uh, from Jonathan Mills. So that is a way in which we are showing and leading by example about the importance of culture to our well-being as a country. Of course, that's one reason of many uh, why we continue to invest in culture. As Jonathan uh, has alluded to already, in recent years, countries and governments right across our globe have faced difficult times, in particular, difficult financial times. The Scottish Government is certainly no exception to that. But throughout that, we have maintained our support for Scotland's culture sector. For example, our budget this year includes a funding increase for culture of almost 10%. We have protected funding for our five national performing companies and we are investing in major capital projects like the creation of a new museum in Stornoway in our Western Islands and the Royal Scottish National Orchestra's new home in Glasgow. Possibly, though, the most obvious example this year is the v and Museum of Design in Dundee, which will open in just three weeks' time. The Scottish Government has been a strong supporter of the museum with an investment of £38 million towards its construction. Uh, the building itself is a showcase of design uh, thanks uh, to world-renowned Japanese architect uh, Kengo Kuma and it's also the focal point of the regeneration of Dundee's waterfront. On the basis of that project, the Wall Street Journal has already listed Dundee as one of its top 10 hot destinations in the world. And Lonely Planet, the producers of the guidebooks, uh, have named Dundee among their 10 best European places to visit in 2018. That kind of international attention will help to bring jobs, investment and business to Dundee. Our hope is that by highlighting the city's design heritage, the museum will also inspire Dundee's next generation of designers and artists. And in doing so, we firmly believe it will enrich the lives of people locally and across our country. The v &A Dundee will showcase Scottish design to visitors from around the world, but it will also, through its exhibition programme, bring the best of international design to Scotland. The museum will therefore be a great example of how culture can widen our horizons. That's something I think is a really important benefit of engaging in culture, something I was commenting on at the Edinburgh Book Festival earlier this week. In my view, reading or consuming other forms of art and culture deepens our understanding for and our empathy with people, cultures and countries uh, of which we may have no direct personal experience. Of course, the recognition that culture can promote international understanding motivated the creation of the Edinburgh Festival in 1947, shortly after the end of the Second World War. During that first festival, the then Lord Provost of Edinburgh, Sir John Faulkner, summed up its founding philosophy. He said, the cultivation of the arts, the increase of prosperity, and the development of universal friendship are matters which outreach our boundaries. 
and the rebirth of joy and enthusiasm in life makes for a people's strength and happiness and health. Those ideals of cooperation, friendship and working towards the common good underpinned much of the post-war settlement and they are at the very heart of international institutions like the European Union and the United Nations, institutions which were designed to bring countries back together, repair lives and provide peace and security. And these ideals, these values, these principles are still fundamental to the Edinburgh festivals today. That's something we should never undervalue. It is one of the reasons why it is so wonderful to be here in the city in August at the height of the festival season, when that spirit of creativity, internationalism and solidarity is so much in evidence. And of course, it's one of the reasons why it's so wonderful to be here with all of you at this summit. A little earlier, uh, the Scottish Culture Secretary Fiona Hislop opened her remarks with a quote from Scotland's first macker, uh, our first national poet, Edwin Morgan. I want to close with the words of Scotland's current macker, uh, Jackie Kay. In 2016, in this very chamber, uh, standing up in the gallery right there, uh, Jackie Kay marked a new session of this Scottish Parliament by reciting a specially written poem. Near the end of that poem, she reflects thus. It takes more than one language to tell a story. Welcome. One language is never enough. Welcome. Come on, Ben, the living room. Come join our brilliant gathering. I'm delighted that you are adding your experiences, your expertise and your languages to this brilliant gathering. As a result, I hope all of us can find new ways of bringing the benefits of culture to more people in our own countries and right around our world. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope you find this summit both informative and perhaps above all else, enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, First Minister. Uh, could I now invite His Excellency, Sir, the Right Honourable Sir Jerry Matipari, High Commissioner of New Zealand to the United Kingdom, to join us at the lectern. Sir Jerry. Rauranga tirama e kuima e koroma e huhui nei tēnei aku mihi mahana ki a koutou. Distinguished leaders, ladies and gentlemen, can I extend to you my warm greetings. Could I also join uh, with those who preceded me in acknowledging the presiding officer and thanking him for the opportunity to be here. Can I also thank uh, Sir Jonathan Mills for this opportunity for me to be here. What I thought I'd do is uh, the theme of my, my comments is the example. Firstly, the example of Scots uh, over time. Secondly, the example and it, as it is for, for New Zealand. And then thirdly, the example of the festival and also this summit. One of the things that distinguishes Scotland in all meanings of that word, its substance, its opinions, its purposes, and how it feels, is its culture. Scots men and Scots women have taken their culture around the globe, and the Scottish diaspora are renowned for celebrating that culture spiritedly in both senses of that word. At the heart of a culture is a language, spoken and written, stories, music and poems. There's a Māori whakatauki or proverb which translated says, my language is my awakening, my language is the window to my soul. And so in the context of my being at this cultural summit in Edinburgh, I thought it would be appropriate for me, as others have done, is to start with uh, quoting a poem, lyrics by Scotland's most famous poet, Robert Robbie Burns. My heart's in the highlands, my heart is not here. My heart's in the highlands, a chasing the deer. Chasing the wild deer and following the roe. My heart's in the highlands, 
wherever I go. The Burns poem reminds us that the Scottish people have always been intrepid explorers, travelling far from home and yet holding an affinity to Scotland and things Scottish. The lyrics help to explain why Scottish culture has reached and taken hold across continents, including to the completely opposite side of the world, to Aotearoa, New Zealand. There are few other countries that have been as, as successful as Scotland in exporting its culture from bagpipes to tartan, to haggis, to highland dancing, and to shortbread and whisky. Scottish culture permeates every corner of New Zealand. Caledonian societies help to ensure that. There are highland games that attract competitors from all over the world to places like Waipu, Hororata, Turakina, and Pairo. Many of our schools wear tartan kilts as part of their uniform. Dunedin, one of our oldest and most prominent cities, its name derived from the Scottish Gaelic name for Edinburgh, is known as the Edinburgh of the South. But I think it's as a people where the impact of our Scottish heritage is most keenly felt. Our strong Scottish roots mean that we share many traits with the people of Scotland. We share a friendliness, a dry sense of humour, and a seriousness in our approach that comes from living in dramatic and unforgiving terrain. We share a canniness, determination, and a can-do attitude where innovation is a cornerstone in our business dealings. And like many Scots, we know how to have a good time, and we do, and certainly I do, enjoy a wee dram. As a country, we value our culture immensely. Our culture, New Zealand's culture, is no longer only on display through the haka at an All Blacks rugby game. And for me, that's exciting to see. We've seized the opportunity to promote things in New Zealand, and nothing is more New Zealand than our language, our reo. We can draw inspiration from Scotland in terms of how successful you have been at showcasing your culture. And this summit is testament to that. The other thing that the Burns poem reminds us is the sentiment that Scottish people and culture have an affinity to the land and that fondness travels with them wherever they go. This is something that strikes a resounding chord with me and I'm sure it would do with most New Zealanders. There's another Māori proverb which goes, toi tu te kupu, toi tu te mana, toi tu te whenua. Your word, your status, the land. These things have an affinity to culture. And it seems to me that the resurgence of our language, te reo Māori, points to the notion that these things start at home. This festival sets a powerful example showcasing culture and through the various events and through exploring different styles, we actually see how interconnected we are. I firmly believe that through sharing our cultures, we have become less foreign to each other. At Edinburgh, we have found an incredibly receptive audience to our culture. New Zealand Māori and Pacifica inspired shows have been hugely popular. From the powerfully provocative to the light-hearted, numerous and diverse New Zealand artists have participated in the Edinburgh festivals through support from our creative New Zealand, Toi Aotearoa. Creative New Zealand works with Scottish institutions to develop meaningful exchanges with our artists and one another's cultures. Relationships established here and in the wider Scotland are something much more profound than simply flying over here to tell our stories. For example, playwright Arthur Meek is presenting his work, Erewan, for the Edinburgh Festival or Fringe Festival this year. 
the play is a result of his participation in the New Zealand-Scotland Playwright Residency and Exchange Programme in 2016. Another is Shannon Tiao's multimedia installation with the Sun Aglow I Have My Pensive Moods 2017. It is the first ever that New Zealand has co-commissioned with the Edinburgh Arts Festival. And of course, Aotearoa New Zealand's presence in the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo, particularly in 2014, with two leading Māori cultural or kapahaka groups, Te Wakahuia and Te Whanaua Apanui, and leading New Zealand Highland dancers, highlighted that as a celebration of our home, our friends and our family. I'm convinced that as we learn, as we learn more about each other and our differences, we can see and celebrate our commonalities and shared aspirations. Ladies and gentlemen, the events that happen here every year in bringing together many cultural ideas and art forms and in the sentiment that the Scots have done in this wonderful city in championing culture is truly extraordinary. At this point in New Zealand's culture, I would be required to sing. I have been told, don't lose your day job. So what I thought I would do is in terms of that connectedness, I'd conclude my comments with a poem written by a Scotsman, John Liddell Kelly, who immigrated to New Zealand in 1880. Kelly wrote a book of poems called Heather and the Fern, Songs of Scotland and Maori. The poem is titled Heather and Fern. Though dear to my heart is Zealandia, for the home of my boyhood I yearn. I dream amid sunshine and grandeur of a land that is misty and stern. From the land of the Moa and the Maori, my thoughts to old Scotia will turn. Thus the heather is blent with the kauri and the thistle entwined with the fern. Nor reda, as I started with, my language is my awakening, my language is the window to my soul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Jerry. I couldn't tell whether people were relieved or disappointed not to hear you sing there. The Edinburgh Festival and Fringe is all about participation, occasionally about humiliation, just warning you. Uh, thank you, Sir Jerry. Our next presentation will be from Dr. Katharina Vaz Pinto, Councillor of Culture for the City of Lisbon, and who will give our thoughts on investing in the locality, how to invest in buildings whilst investing in people. Dr. Vaz Pinto. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me start to thank the honour of being here at this prestigious summit and for allowing me to share with you some views on the role of culture and the role of cities and the need of human scale. I changed a little bit the content of my presentation, but it will come to investment, sorry. <laughs> As we well know and attest in our daily lives, our world is becoming increasingly complex, confused and unintelligible as a result of the deep and sudden changes brought about by globalization and the digital paradigm that invaded our daily lives at work, in our personal lives, in our free time. It is a paradigm incepted with the creation of immense expectation regarding the ability to foster wealth, exchange and sharing, the ability of recognizing the other. Today, however, we live in a divided, fractured world. It confronts us with a broad range of phenomena of exclusion, conflict and even refusal of the other. If, on the one hand, we are immediately and constantly connected, more efficient and swift in our work, and we do have access to unparalleled amounts of information and goods, on the other hand, we often feel insecure and unsatisfied with the uncertainty of present life. We challenge the sense of time, distance, place, human relationship to which we were accustomed to, which technology has come to accelerate or modify. 
We are permanently connected with the world, yet we can feel as we feel we were completely alone in our homes. The commodity-based ideology of economic success, of technological progress and accumulation of assets, exacerbated by financial crisis, climate change, wars and forced migration, has led to the adoption of production and consumption patterns of lifestyles that came to generate levels of inequality, stress, loss of relationship with nature and alienation in a less cohesive world. I believe culture can make connection across those divisions in our society, as well as it can create the conditions for mutual understanding and ultimately it can work as a way of fostering social cohesion and cooperation over the borders. That is why I believe that change can only be achieved through the appreciation of the cultural dimension in global development. Culture is the vital ability for expression and symbolic constructions. It allows us to affirm identity, to build a sense of belonging, of public space, to think upon defining options and values, to establish the links between past, present and future, to fulfill desires and to find an individual and collective purpose for the time we live in. Culture is what makes us different. Culture is what makes us human. So, in order to address the negative effects of today's reality, it is paramount to put culture at the center of public policies by protecting heritage, by supporting creativity, by promoting diversity, by granting access to knowledge, taking advantage of the technology, technological evolution and conf the comfort provided by economic vitality, but also thinking to creating a counterbalance and new ways of connecting the analog and the digital world. The territory within a specific physical and neighboring space is where we can try to reinstate this balance, making our cities more human and more sustainable. Cities that are, that are more close-knit, where everybody has the same rights and access to the same opportunities. Cities that seek to activate, mobilize, accommodate the creative energies of all, bringing forward conditions to build bonds, ties of belonging and solidarity, a spirit of active citizenship, Cities that seek the appropriate scale for each project or activities by taking into, a into account the target or prospective audiences, the level of funding or other, other available resources and the actual needs. Cities that promote and welcome human diversity, respecting the unique uniqueness of each and every group, ethnic, religious, gender, artistic or cultural. Cities able to function as an ecosystem, seeking to articulate a varied public policies, combining public-private resources, and realizing the role of each actor in their specific mission and their contribution to the big plan. Lisbon is now experiencing a moment of great and unquestioned vitality. Unlike what we have seen in recent years, even here in Europe, in Lisbon, we want to be on the side of those who are open to the world. In fact, this is an ancient identity trait of our city. The geostrategic position of the country and of Lisbon in the westernmost point of the European continent dictates its everlasting conditions as an intersection between Europe, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, points of arrivals and departures, places of exchanges and gathering of culture. The Phoenicians, the Romans, the Arabs inhabited Lisbon throughout the ages, the ages, and already in the 12th century, an English cruiser traveling through Lisbon was astonished to see so many people in the city. In a letter signed just R, he wrote that the reason for such a huge agglomeration of people was that between them there was no obligatory religion. And since anyone could have the religions that they wanted, from all over the world, men would gather here. If geography favored us, it is true that we also learn from history. In all the periods in which we repress and reject diversity, we lost economic, political, and cultural relevance. 
well, whenever we respected and valued cultural and spiritual diversity, we progressed, we became wealthier as a people and more sympathetic and tolerant, and we have held Lisbon as a great cosmopolitan metropolis. Therefore, geography does not waive the permanent construction and reinvention of an identity that we wish to be open, hospitable, happy and sad, attentive to the contemporary world. A city that's capable of creating a public space, a common square, a community in every neighborhood, on every corner, in every park. A city capable of responding to the anxieties that afflict us all, women and men of our time, those who live and work in Lisbon, those that are in transit, all of them in search of meaning, of happiness, of peace. As far as culture is concerned, we went through a first stage of diagnosis and strategic redefinition, reorganization, creating and rehabilitating infrastructures so, we, so that we can go now into a stage of consolidation where local public authorities in the area of culture act as a facilitating and capacity building agent and work to bring culture closer to the people and vice versa, to bring people closer to culture in order to combine the attraction for culture with the need for culture. Following said purpose, the public space has been one of the priority areas of our intervention, open to all, present in all parts, without social or economic barriers. As one of our most prominent artists, Alshan Fart Akavils, whose street art is scattered throughout the city of Lisbon and currently all over the world, with his oversized scratch murals that invariably show anonymous faces sculptured in the stones of buildings, we look at the common and anonymous citizen. He or she is the protagonist and agent of change in today's world. It is with this citizen in mind that we want to design our policies and demonstrate the transformative power of culture. Thank you very much. Pinto, thank you very much indeed. And uh, our final speaker in the chamber in this section is the Vice Chairman and Co-Chief Executive of the Kissinger Association, Mr Joshua Rammel. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. It's great to hear the greetings from the many political figures here. Sir Jonathan, thank you very much for your hospitality. There's many places I could begin the story that uh, I want to tell today, but I thought I would start on another summer's afternoon, a hot, humid, mugged summer afternoon in 1506 in the middle of rural Germany when a young German student was making his way home from Stauderfeld to Erfurt, where he was in school studying law. It was a summer afternoon like any summer afternoon. If you were in central Germany today, there might be a similar thunderstorm brewing up. But what makes this particular storm different is that it descended somewhat by surprise on this young student. Martin Luther was 21 years old that day. He was walking through the woods and suddenly it begins to rain and hail and lightning. A tremendous storm is upon him. He cowers under the assault and he makes a promise. If he gets out of it alive, he'll enter a monastery. Luther's progress from that afternoon is well known to us, the theological journey that produced the Reformation. He would later say that the essence of what he experienced in that thunderstorm, the raw power of nature, evoked for him a powerful idea of St. Paul, the notion that faith is passed from faith to faith. There was no need for an intermediary, that every individual could have their own direct access to God. This was, at the time, a revolutionary idea. It unlocked, as I will describe, everything we know today about being modern. But I mention it now because that moment in the Straudernheim forest marked the start of a fundamental pivot in the human experience. And I believe we are now on the edge of another fundamental human experience change, and the role of culture in that, as we will see, is vital. My idea is that all of the noises we hear around us today, the political breakage, the uncertainty, the miracle sounds of hopes of new ideas, mark the first measures of a new era, 
one that may surpass the Enlightenment in its impact. This new era is still only dimly apparent to us in its ideas, in its rules, in its habits, but it is one that will fundamentally change the nature of the human experience. And it is the role of culture during this transition I wish to discuss today. Paul's idea, the one that was so appealing to Luther, that faith could be transmitted from faith to faith, is fundamentally a line about directness. The great break of the Reformation was the idea that individuals could have their own access to God. They didn't need a church, they didn't need anybody else standing the way, they didn't need to pay money. Every individual themselves could have access to God. This idea of Luther's was in harmony with a whole series of ideas that were breaking out around him. People like Galileo and Copernicus had the idea that individuals could have their own access to knowledge, to science, bringing the ideas of Aristotle to real life. And that triggered other processes that were part of the Enlightenment, the idea that individuals should have their own access to political power. Individuals should have their own access to commercial power, to decide what they wanted to do with their lives, that what was for so many years a prison for people of where they were born and who their parents were could be replaced by people living the lives that they themselves wanted to lead, the essence, in short, of being modern. The explosive force of that summer thunderstorm was really unlocking a furious energy of freedom that had held people back for so many years until it was released suddenly, the power to learn, to read, to vote, to think. All of these represented a tremendous change. This was not, however, a peaceful process. It involved the destruction of almost every institution in Europe over a 400-year period. It produced war after war after war. Luther's insights, for instance, directly produced the wars of the Reformation, which were the most violent wars that Europe had seen to that point. You get a sense of this if you read Luther. We know him for his 95 theses, but he had this feeling that the Reformation was unleashing this accelerating process of violence and turned later in his life to writing pamphlets uh, such as Against the Murderous, Thieving Hordes of Peasants. And these peasants were simply following the advice that he had given. Find your own way forward. Have your own access to God. Live the life that you yourself dreamed. No pamphlet was going to stop that because what those murderous, thieving peasants were trying to steal was their own freedom and their own liberty. About halfway into this four-century string of change that began with the Reformation and then went to the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution and the Industrial Revolution and the modern revolution of the 20th century, a great debate broke out not so very far from here. On the one side was David Hume, who needs no introduction here. He was born about 50 miles from here in Berwickshire in 1711 and went on to become one of the great minds and thinkers of the Enlightenment. But on the other side was a less well-known but equally formidable Scottish clergyman named George Campbell, who was born in 1719 in Aberdeen and considered himself a student of Hume's. The debate between them had to do with a problem that we don't pay much attention to today, but was essential in the era of the Enlightenment. Do miracles exist? This may seem like kind of a silly, outdated debate, sort of a Rorschach test on your own faith. Do you believe in miracles or do you not believe in miracles? But it was the kind of debate that was really at the front lines of the Enlightenment because it was a debate about the question of whether or not problems could be cracked by human reason. Was there any part of the world that could not be understood by the use of the human mind? Which was really another way of asking, was there any source of power any place in the world that had access to ideas and powers and tools of freedom that humans should not have access to. Before the Reformation, power was incredibly concentrated in the hands of a few kings, feudal lords, priests. They had all the knowledge, all of the information. And then one day, that began to break down, and it triggered this massive wave of change. Where we are today is at the beginning of an equivalent wave of change. It is one that will be marked by miracles, for sure, and also by the sorts of tragedies that came along with the Reformation and everything that came after it. And it's an understanding the nature of that change that I think we can begin to address the importance of culture. The nature of the revolution emerging around us today has to do with the fact that we're entering an era of networks. And by networks, I don't just mean the internet. I mean any set of connected points. People who sit in this parliament building are a network. People who speak Mandarin are a network. People who use Bitcoin are a network. The fundamental insight is that connection changes the nature of an object, it changes the nature of every object, a connected voter, a connected library, a connected actor, a connected performance. They're all different than ones that are not connected. And that is a shift in the nature of power. 
If the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution were all about liberating individuals, freeing them from that tyranny of history and where they were born, this revolution is about connecting people. And connecting introduces fundamentally new dynamics of power. We're just in the earliest stages of understanding this. We're sort of in the position that Locke might have been in, of just having a, the hint that something was changing, but something dramatic changing. And all of us who spend time working and thinking about network theory realize how early we are in this process. But I thought I would just give you one example of the nature of this shift. So we said that the nature of the Enlightenment was about distributing power more widely than ever, crawling it, pulling it out of, out of the hands of kings and feudal lords and giving it to individuals. And to some degree, this technological revolution that we're undergoing right now is very much about distributing power. We all have in our hands, in our pockets, in our laptops, in our computers, in our phones, more computing power than existed on the entire planet 250 years ago. We're connected to great sources of information. We can get knowledge instantly, so it's true that power is radically distributed by technology. But we also see something else going on. Power is becoming incredibly concentrated. Today, there are about a dozen platform companies, is what we call them in the world, that have more than a billion users each. And the more people who use these, the more powerful they become. The more people who use a mapping service or a social network, the smarter that system gets, and therefore more people need to use it. And so we have the balance of power today moving from this habit of distribution that we had in the past towards two things happening simultaneously an incredible distribution of power and an incredible concentration of power at exactly the same time. It's sort of like the model of the atom, right? Another great fruit of the Enlightenment, where you have the incredible concentration of neutrons and protons in the center and electrons on the outside. And the more electrons you have, the stronger that central core needs to be. And the more people you have using a mapping program, for instance, the stronger that mapping software becomes, the better it knows the world around it. So more people use it, so it gets even smarter. The same is true of the future artificial intelligence systems we'll have. The more people are diagnosed on a medical database, the better that medical database gets, and therefore, the more people want to use it. So power has moved from being incredibly concentrated to being incredibly dis distributed to this new model, this tense, pulling skein of power on which we live now. And this process is what is tearing apart many of the institutions that we once came to rely on. Think about the family doctor that you might go to for medical treatment. He used to be your last word in care. Today, the minute you're diagnosed with something, you're trying to find the answer on some sort of internet search engine. You're looking at different internet news feeds and web pages and tweets to get information. That's this distribution of power. At the same time, in four or five years, an artificially intelligent database will be able to out-diagnose your doctor because of this concentration of information. So that role of the doctor in the middle is just being pulled apart. Or think about the traditional media. It used to be that you had the BBC or your newspaper sitting in the middle. Today you have this massive distribution of people tweeting and putting their ideas out there, and this massive concentration, and the traditional structures are being just torn apart by that. This is what it means to live in a revolutionary age. When you look in my country, the United States, we've never had a period where the legitimacy of every public institution, the press, the presidency, the Congress, science, has been as low as it has been as it is right now. And the reason for that is these revolutionary pressures which are falling on institutions that are not built for this new age. Same thing happened during the Enlightenment. The kings, the feudal lords, the popes, they all were built for a different fundamental structure of power. So the idea to keep in your minds as we move into this new period is so many of the things around us today that look strange or unusual or unnerving are not one-off things. They are expressions of this underlying shift in power that will be as dramatic and significant as the Enlightenment itself. Bigger than World War I, bigger than World War II, a fundamental change in the human condition. The role of culture in such an era is really the thing that allows human society to progress through these massive step changes in what it fundamentally means to be alive and be on this earth. There's so many examples of this, but one of the ones that I often return to is the notion of what happened in Vienna in 1900. Think about Vienna in 1900. You have the seeds of the worst political fever that is about to break over the continent that will kill millions of people, fascism. You have communism also taking root there and the beginnings of an ideological struggle that will dominate the 20th century and subject the entire planet to incredible risk. But at the same time in 1900, what do you have in Vienna? You have Mahler. You have Freud, you have Shostakovich. You have the incredible sounds of new ideas and new music, the images of Klimt coming alive. And as we look back on that today, 120 years later, the power of the ideas of fascism, the power of the ideas of communism, these have all faded away. They come back from time to time, but the impact on our daily life is nothing like it was 100 years ago. But to go hear a symphony of Mahler, to go see a painting of Klimt, 
is to take you right to the essence of the human condition. The age that we're living in is this rare age, the beginning of a period of total revolution, just like that summer's day that Martin Luther encountered in 1506. And the best possible reaction to it, the reaction that defines us and makes us the most human, is the reaction that comes from culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua. And uh, she has sent her apologies at not being able to join us, but I'm delighted to introduce a video message from the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the Right Honourable Theresa May. Every August, tens of thousands of artists and millions of visitors descend on Edinburgh in the world's biggest celebration of art and culture. So it's fitting that this city also plays host to the world's largest gathering of culture ministers. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today for the fourth Edinburgh International Culture Summit. The theme for this year's event is Connecting Peoples and Places, a reflection of culture's unique ability to bring people together from different nations and different backgrounds. It truly is an international language, as we can see in the huge range of nations represented by delegates and speakers this year, from Switzerland to Singapore, via the USA, Palestine, Rwanda, and many more. From art and music to theatre and filmmaking, the UK has long been a world leader in all aspects of culture. But there is no monopoly on turning creative sparks into global success. This summit is an incredible opportunity for everyone here to share their experiences, to look at policy ideas and interventions, and to discuss what works, and, just as importantly, what to avoid. Just as culture connects people and places, so this conference connects those who have the power to make a difference for artists and performers around the world. So thank you to everyone who has helped make this event happen, including the Scottish Government, the British Council, the Edinburgh International Festival, and our hosts here at the Scottish Parliament. Thanks to all of you for coming. And may I wish everyone here every success for the rest of the summit. Thank you. Now, Sir Jerry tantalised us with a suggestion of a song earlier, um, and there will be opportunities to participate in the coming days. However, no session uh, of the Culture Summit would be complete without a performance, an artistic performance, to complement our discussion. So to conclude our session, it's my pleasure to introduce Pu Kunqin, President of the China Theatre Association and noted actor Charlene Boyd, to perform two spoken pieces, To Be or Not To Be, and a passage from Pu Kunqin's play about a noted early Ming Dynasty poet, Li Bai. Pu Kunqin and Charlene Boyd. <laughs> to be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream, Aye, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death, 
What dreams do come when we shake off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns the patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than to fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly door with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pitch and moment, with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action.生存还是毁灭这是值得考虑的问题默默忍受命运残虐的毒箭还是挺身反抗并结束这无涯的苦难这两种行为哪一种更高贵死了睡着了什么都没有了要是在这样一种睡眠中我们心头的创痛以及其他无数血肉之躯所不能避免的打击都可以从此消失那正是我求之不得的结局死了睡着了对了睡着了还会做梦障碍就在这儿因为一旦我们摆脱了这句腐
，江上泛起了玉液金波。这不是一江的水，是一江的酒啊！不用金樽，不用玉碗，就扑下身子，和他三万六千日。明月，明月，你说，人世间什么最公正？光阴最公正，他不会因为你权势显赫而低眉奉献一分，也不会因为你道德高尚。就额外加恩一寸，啊，好一片芦苇荡啊！原来这是月亮里桂树的影子，平平平，仄仄。啧啧啧，平平；啧啧，平平；啧，平平；啧啧，平。李白在水里捞月亮，融入水，融入月。Life is but a hundred years, thirty-six thousand days. Oh, how I wish to empty three hundred glasses every day! Wow, look! The river is filled with water, like. Jade, and the waves are gilded with gold. No. 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 Not water. The river is filled with wine. <laughs> Forget about your golden goblets and jade bowls. Just. Dive right in and and drink some thirty thousand days. Moon. <gasps> oh, moon. <laughs> Tell me, who is the fairest of them all? It must be time. Time treats everyone as equals. It won't give a minute more to powerful sovereigns, nor will it award an extra second to persons with perfect integrity. <sighs> What a wonderful! Piece of reed bed. <gasps> Could it be the reflection of the cinnamon on the moon? Ah! <laughs> ah! <laughs> Extending his arms towards the reflection of the moon on the river, with an attempt to grasp it. Levi gradually dissolved in the water and the moon. <laughs> A speech about the power of theatre, the power of poetry and literature, the power of intercultural exchange and integration. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 自然世界不是人类创造的，而人类社会、科学技术、物质、精神生活是
人类创造的。这几千年来的伟大的创造力是从哪里来的？是从索取自然的能源而来，更是从认识自然世界和人类自身的社会发展史后产生的智慧中而来的。Humans have not created the natural world, but they indeed have created the human society, science, and technology, as well as an amazing store of material and spiritual wealth. Where did this great power of creativity come from? It came from wresting energy from nature. It also stemmed from wisdom, which was derived from knowledge of the natural world and history of the human society. 伟大的莎士比亚的三十多部戏剧作品，从宇宙天体到地球，从自然界的奥妙到人类的社会的变革，从人间道德到家庭伦理，从王公贵族到平民百姓，无奇不有的全部收落在他的戏剧中，其中还包括着他对。超自然的魔幻世界和未来世界的猜想，他的这种认识力量，艺术的创造力，是无人可比的。Within the thirty-some plays created by Shakespeare, he had included in the theatrical plots, as well as the lines and behaviors of the characters, subject matters ranging from celestial bodies and the earth to natural wonders and transformation of the human society. From the good and evil of morality to the cultivation of familial ethics, from the kings and aristocracy, from the kings and aristocracy to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, as well as from supernatural worlds filled with fantastical spirits to imaginary versions of the future world. The ability of William Shakespeare to understand the world and to create artistic and literary works is simply peerless. 戏剧悟道，艺术修身。戏剧舞台艺术是我们认识这个所处的世界的一门学科。剧场如同课堂，也如同教堂一样。艺术是一个个人品德成长的必修课。艺术爱好者和观众通过戏剧，在对世界和自我的认知力、想象力、表达力和幽默乐趣的性情方面获得启发。I have delivered several lectures to university students with the title of Theatre Enlightenment and Artistic Education. As a form of art, theatre helps the audience to understand the world they are living in. Theatre is not unlike a classroom or church in which compulsory courses are taught regarding the cultivation of virtues. A theatre-goer's perception of the world, his or her imagination, expression and sense of humour Will all be enriched by the plays that he or she sees. 戏剧是舞台上由演员为观众表演的一种文明生活方式，是可以看到的视听文学。文学是首先的，戏剧首通常说的是文学的第二度创作。我们剧院的老院长于世之先生这样说。戏剧最美的境界应该是入诗入画的，同时具备着哲思和文学内涵。As a mode of civilized life that is derived from literature, theatre is at the same time a form of figurative, audiovisual literature which involves the live performance of actors and actresses on the stage. A literary text must come first. And theatre often refers to the process and result of recreation based on that text. According to Mr. Yu Shuji, the late artistic director of Beijing People's Art Theatre, theatre at its best must be be able to evoke similar senses of beauty as great poetry and paintings do, with comparable philosophical and liter literary connotations that are both simple and plentiful. 文化文明是人类共有的精神财富。人类不同地域、民族的人们有着生理感知本能和对文化文明的认识愿望，这便是基于好奇、羡慕和被警示
被启发的心理需求。我们热爱。I'm sorry. Yeah. Cultures and civilizations are the shared spiritual wealth of all human beings. People from different regions and ethnicities are born with similar impulses and wishes to perceive the world and understand the human civilization, i.e., the similar psychological needs based on curiosity, admiration, caution, and inspiration. We love and respect the Shasha Bia, this cultural heritage, and we are willing to continue 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 to和在四百年前就有了的对世界和未来的认识。他的作品永远具备当代意识。我们要把莎士比亚的戏剧传承下去。五百年后，这个世界还在演。我曾经有幸被邀请到爱丁堡，呃，同我的剧团一起在这里演